Hi, I'm Hamish Johnston, editor of Physics World. And one of the great pleasures of uh, working on Physics World is that I get to uh, introduce uh, the winners of the Physics World Breakthrough of the Year Award. Um, this year, I'm very pleased to say that the winners, and there are over a thousand scientists this year who have won the award, the award um, are the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. And they've won for their revolutionary first ever detection of gravitational waves. Um, the, the waves that they detected uh, were made by two coalescing black holes. And um, th this sort of gravitational wave was first predicted um, nearly uh, 100 years before it was discovered by um, Albert Einstein and his um, general theory of relativity. Um, uh, not only have they uh, made a first detection of gravitational waves, um, shortly after um, they detected um, a second gravitational wave, also from coalescing black holes. Um, the Breakthrough of the Year Award is chosen by uh, Physics World editors, and there are four main criteria that we use. Um, the first is that it has to be of funda fundamental importance to physics research. The second is that it has to represent a significant advance in knowledge. It also has to have a strong connection between theory and experiment. And I think it's very safe to say that the detection of gravitational waves has that. And finally, it has to be of general interest to all physicists. And again, this was not only of interest to physicists, this was <coughs> of interest to everybody around the world. Um, so I'm very, very happy to say that six members of the LIGO team are here with me uh, in cyberspace. Um, in Washington, D.C., um, we're, joined, we're joined by uh, Gabriela Gonzalez, who is the spokesperson for um, the LIGO scientific collaboration. We've got um, Alessandra Papa, who is uh, a member of the collaboration and from the Ma Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics. We've got Brian O'Reilly, who works at LIGO Livingston. Uh, there are two LIGO detectors, one in Hanford, Washington, and the other in Livingston, Louisiana. Um, and um, finally, we've got um, Mike Landry, who's also in Washington, and he works at the uh, Hanford detector. Um, coming across uh, the Atlantic in uh, Glasgow, at the University of Glasgow, we've got um, Sheen, uh, Sheila Rowan, who is a director of the Institute of Gravitational Research there. And last but not least, in, uh, at LIGO in Livingston, Louisiana, we have Joe Giami. Um, and so welcome everybody and congratulations on uh, winning the Physics World uh, Breakthrough of the Year. Um, thank, you. Thank, you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I've, I've got a few questions uh, for our panel. We're really lucky to have an esteemed panel of gravitational wave experts here. Um, and the, the, the first question, um, uh, this is a question for Mike, Mike Landry. Um, can you uh, recall the moment when you realized that LIGO had indeed detected a gravitational wave? And what, what was that like? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Amish. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk with Brian about this too and, and let him actually start. Uh, but the, the one thing I'll say to, to open is just that the event, uh, it's not a quite a eureka moment. You, you realize you've got something interesting in the detector and it takes really months to convince yourself that you have an actual gravitational wave. So maybe Brian can lead off about it. Yeah, so the, the setup for advanced LIGO, we had a, an engineering run, what we call an engineering run to shake down the detectors. That was a very successful engineering run this time. Um, by the time we got towards the end, everything was running really smoothly. Uh, we had a meeting of what we call our joint run planning committee on the Thursday, where we were trying to decide when exactly to begin the observing run proper. And we waited a few days to let the final uh, touches be applied so that we could instantly send alerts to our electromagnetic observing partners. So we were still technically in the engineering run, but with very good detectors, as we as we found out when we let them run for weeks and weeks to collect background of this event. So I came in on Monday morning, and the operator said that he'd received a phone call 
or a, a phone call in, in the middle of the night. Actually, I think it was on the TeamSpeak uh, speaker that they have opened, asking if, if the detectors were running because this person had seen some kind of an event. So it was quite unusual. It turned out later we traced that to a, a post op in Germany. And so I went to our nine o'clock uh, morning meeting. It's kind of a group leads meeting at Livingston that we have every week. And I mentioned this event. And so at that stage, it was a curiosity. We didn't know if there was something going on, if somebody had made an injection and it had been you know, picked up. There was a, a paucity of information. And so let me throw it over to Mike now to continue the story. Sure. Thanks, Brian. Uh, so uh, many of us in North America woke up to this email uh, from postdocs uh, Marco Drago and Andy Lundgren at the AEI in, in Germany saying that there was this interesting uh, trigger in the data and could it be real or could it be an injection? So, so what's an injection? We uh, simulate uh, gravitational waves in our detector. You, you have to know something about general relativity and the response to the detector and you really actuate on the arms of the detector to, to mimic at the output of the gravitational uh, wave port uh, something that looks like a gravitational wave. And so people knew this could happen, that we could put, we would, could have an injection, we could have a flavor of injection which is blind, where we don't tell the collaboration that there's been an event. And uh, so m many of us, when we came into the observatories, were asking the question, you know, it was, could this be a blind injection? And so I talked to our blind injection uh, lead at Hanford, Jeff Kissel, and, and I couldn't ask him whether or not we had a blind injection, but I could ask him, are we in a phase in which we could expect a blind injection because the collaboration can know that. And to my amazement, Jeff <laughs> said no. <laughs> and so that started the process really of understanding this wasn't, a, wasn't an injection, uh, but was rather a, a really interesting trigger. And it, and it takes months to, to sort after that. Yeah, so, so at the... Uh... 11 o'clock meeting for detector characterization. Um, Michael made this uh, announcement on, on, on the TeamSpeak that this was definitively not a blind injection. And I, I remember at Livingston, the whole mood in the room changed. And that started this roller coaster of meetings and discussions and trying to track down every conceivable loophole. And every day I remember I would come to work and, and I would say, okay, you know, the other shoe is going to drop. Somebody's going to find something. And every day that didn't happen. And so it got, as Mike said, it wasn't really a eureka thing. It was just, it was this kind of blur of activity where you didn't have time to say, you know, is it, is it real or is it not? It just kept getting more and more real. I, I learned about this event first thing in the morning by reading the email threads from the analysis people, not just this postdoc in, in Germany, but also the people in, in the eastern, <laughs> in the eastern coast in Florida and other people who had been following this up. And they were all asking, who injected this? <laughs> the first, one of the first things I learned was a text message from Mike asking exactly that. <laughs> was this an injection? Did you authorize that? And of course, I didn't, and uh, although it took me a few hours to, to convince myself that this wasn't a, an intentional injection. Um, and then I knew uh, that we had months ahead to work on this. It was very exciting. Again, it wasn't a eureka moment because at every day, every week, we thought this could go away. There could be something wrong with it. It took months to, to get to the end of that. But it was on Tuesday when I went to the observatory carrying a very large cake. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how excited we were. <laughs> I mean, you have to understand that this was a, a beautiful signal. I mean, it, it stood out in the data. It was remarkably strong. And so when you showed it to people, the, their first reaction was it had to be an injection. You know, nature cannot be this kind to us. But it was, it's a wonderful, wonderful signal. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember showing this to our, our then observatory head, Fred Robb, and showing him the time frequency uh, plot of the event. And he said, well, that's it. That's it. It's either, you know, the signal or, or we injected it. It, it <laughs> felt that definitive because it was that loud. And, and when you're, you're making um, these measurements, the, the interferometers, they're, they're measuring very, very, very tiny 
fluctuations in 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 space time and uh, uh, apparently sensitive to um changes in in distance of about one one thousandth the diameter of a proton how how exactly um does that work joe um how how do you how how does LIGO make those measurements? It's a, it's a good question. When when we give tours around here, and and I say that um, um, the people who are bothered by it the most are the people who know more more about physics. The the general public accept that like they accept so many things from us um, without without too much argument. But the more you know about physics, the more you find that that statement really troublesome. Um, it, we're measuring lengths over over four kilometers um, to, to, as you say, less than a thousand the diameter of a proton. And physicists all know that if you look at a, if you look at any solid object at room temperature, the atoms are moving around far, far more than that. And so the first thing we do is we have to make that measurement over a pretty large area, kind of a you know about around this big with a great big beam that averages over all those atoms. We need to use a lot of light so that we can have a great, a, 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 so there's a lot of photons involved and so this, the photon statistics aren't an issue. And then finally, just standing around out here in a field at the observatory, your feet are moving around by a millionth of a meter. So that's way too big. So one, one, of, the, one of the things that we have to, 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 to account for is to make sure that the mirrors that are between which we're making the measurement those mirrors are really well isolated from ground vibration. Um, and so we do that a number of ways. We start from the outside, the ground, this actually, this crazy looking thing over here is one of, one of the pieces we use that's an actuator that essentially pushes around the whole in vacuum payload in, in each, each vacuum tank so that it follows inertia rather than the noisy ground. And then it works more stages, there are many stages, and by the time you get down to the test mass, the test mass is just following gravity, it's very quiet. Sheila will tell you more about that last bit. Over. Sheila, do you have anything to uh, to add to that? Sure. So, I mean, one of the one of the you I mean you, you talked about how tiny the measurements are that we're trying to make, how sensitive the detectors have to be, and that's actually why the field has taken so long to get to this point. We're making incredibly sensitive measurements. And so um, there actually was a whole first round of detectors, a first global network of detectors that did searches actually for several years looking for signals, didn't see anything. And I think we all kind of knew that the detectors need better, the technology needed to be improved. So about 2010, that initial network was turned off and there were a whole set of upgrades to the technology that's inside these big observatories to make them better. And it's, it's a, a very global collaboration. It's a global network of detectors of which the LIGO observatories, the, the most the advanced are the ones that are being running first in their advanced configuration. But at the same time as the initial detectors were run, scientists around the world were in their laboratories working on the technology to try and improve them and so for advanced LIGO that that centered around a couple of things one of which was higher power lasers again Joe said we needed a lot of photons in these measurements so so there were there were for years of laser developments about the mirrors again there were four terms of ultra pure glass that's the kind of test particles that the gravitational waves actually cause to move and, and Joe said those had to be highly isolated so that nothing else apart from a gravitational wave caused them move. so we we suspend them very very carefully from from pure glass fibers so they're hanging very very quietly um, four stages of isolation that they hang from then they're attached to those isolation systems that Joe talked about. Again, a whole set of scientists working on those. So it took a whole, that's why there are all these scientists in the collaboration, a lot of people working on the technology to make the instruments work, as well as a lot of figuring out how to analyze the data, understanding what signals come in, bringing that all together. So last year when we turned them on, um, we, were, we were in a good place.
And Sheila, the, my understanding is that the detectors have just started up again from uh, uh, another upgrade. So how, how, how much more sensitive are, are, are you now? And um, you know, how, how many gravitational waves per month or per day could you, could you see at your current sensitivity? Well, I think I'll hand over to Gabby to answer that one. Gabby, we can't hear you. Hi. Hi, Gabby. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, we, uh, I'm an experimental physicist, so from experience, we ran uh, with good sensitivity last year for four months. Of those four months, we had about 45 days of coincident data, and we detected two very confident events, one, one plausible candidate, uh, that uh, that is there. Uh, so it's very difficult to extrapolate from just two events. We have slightly better sensitivity now. It's winter, so the operators are again not working all the time, but we have about half, we will have about half time coincident, coincidence time. We'll take data for six months. So we expect to see a few more black holes, but now we are open to surprises too. We know that nature is kind and can surprise us, so we don't discount that. You you, you mentioned um, surprises, Gabby. Um, I've got I've got a question for um, Alessandra. The 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 two events that you've seen, and I think there's a third event that is a is a possible event. Um, all three of those is, um, are from coalescing black holes um, of a you know of a certain size. Is that is that something that you expected? When you when you first set out um, uh, to look for gravitational waves, or has that come of, as a bit of a surprise? Well, um, first of all, um, LIGO we cast a very broad net as we search for signals in our data set. That comprises looking for signals not just from uh, the coalescence of binary objects that them being black holes or neutron stars, but we also search for signals from you know, catastrophic uh, events that would give rise to very short uh, bursts of gravitational waves. We search for uh, longer signals, uh, weak trains of persistent uh, gravitational waves. We search for uh, stochastic backgrounds of gravitational waves. And uh, of all these uh, types of signals that we search for, um, the most uh, uh, reliable predictions that though, however, still span the orders of magnitude came from the in spirals of uh, compact objects of so smaller masses, so neutron stars. So in that respect, uh, it was a surprise in the sense that uh, it wasn't um, black holes, black holes even in this mass range, were not among the assured uh, sources. Um, but the rates that we are measuring right now are certainly consistent with a very broad range of expectations. So in some ways, this was a first surprise. Uh, it was the first sort of really uncharted territory. It was a lovely surprise. <laughs> So, so does that does that mean that with with those detections we have learned something new about black holes? Is that is that uh, is it safe to say that? Well, certainly. So certainly, we've 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 we started to probe uh, actually populations, so mass ranges for these type of systems. We have actually made a first direct observation of uh, an in spiral of of two black holes, the first direct observations, we could say, of black holes um, all together. And so we have really started with this first observation of black holes, uh, a new era of astronomy, astronomical observations, given the nature of the objects. Okay, and that, that you, you speak about this new era, that's this, this idea of, of multi-messenger astronomy. Um, uh, is, is there someone there who can um, perhaps explain uh, to the audience what multi-messenger astronomy is and, and why it's important that, uh, that we do it? 
Yes, uh, actually, we there, there are already examples in what we call now traditional astronomy <laughs> of multi-messenger astronomy. Uh, there are objects that you see not just in different wavelengths, uh, but also with different instruments. Uh, supernovas, for example, the 1987 supernova was seen not just with optical telescopes, but with neutrino observations. So you can learn a lot more about the different aspects, not just the, the atoms producing <coughs> electromagnetic waves, but also the particles. And now with gravitational waves, we can see about the masses and the space time. So uh, th there is a very high expectation uh, that in the future, as the detectors become more sensitive and as we are able to point better to the location of the sources, we'll be able to see uh, signals from the objects with gravitational wave detectors that tells us about the masses and the space time, with neutrinos that tell us about particles emitted, and with electromagnetic waves of different wavelengths, X-ray, radio, optical, uh, and they tell us about the matter that produces uh, those electromagnetic waves. And that is the kind of um, revolution in astronomy uh, that lets you learn the whole picture, the big picture of the event. And that will happen. We, um, as the detectors become more sensitive, we have talked about this advanced light, though they are not yet working at the potential that they, they can. So there are several years ahead, a few we hope, in which they will be two or three times better than what they are now. And that increases, of course, the rate of observations that we will see. Some of these will be binary systems with compact objects, with neutron stars, so that we expect electromagnetic radiation. Um, we will talk later about how with different, with more than two detectors, and we will have a worldwide network of detectors, you can be able to localize the sources better and tell our astro astronomer friends there. <laughs> point your telescope there, not there, like we have done with these first two detections. And that is a new era of multi-messenger astronomy that's very exciting. Okay, you, you, you mentioned um, having more gravitational wave detectors. Um, Mike and Joe, could you maybe explain, um, uh, maybe give us a run through of, of some of the detectors that are planned or are currently being built and how you know, how they would complement um, LIGO. Sure, why don't I take a crack at it and Joe can follow up. Um, so everything gets better with more gravitational wave detectors. We have LIGO is these two uh, gravitational wave de large scale detectors in the United States, LIGO Hanford in Washington State, and LIGO Louisiana uh, in Livingston Parish in Louisiana, and uh, a smaller detector, which is a high frequency detector, GEO in Germany. And with the first observations and two long, large-scale interferometers uh, detecting these binary black holes, we put this error box in the sky, which was quite a large error box, as Gabby noted, something on the order of 800, 900 square degrees for those, those events, which is a lot of space for uh, electromagnetic astronomers to follow up on. Uh, so there's other detectors around the world that are, are uh, are built and are being commissioned now. So Virgo is a detector in uh, Pisa, in Kashna, near Pisa, uh, which is a three kilometer detector, which will come online sometime next year and start making observations. And so that's a critical input, which, uh, you know, it, the detectors will, they'll be on more often with additional detectors. So the, the duty factor, your ability to sense gravitational waves goes up. Uh, your reach goes up in some sense, uh, and your uh, the error box that you make in the sky uh, begins to shrink. And so the, those three detectors will, will, will be online at some point next year together, uh, searching for gravitational waves. You also have Kagra, which is a Japanese experiment uh, that is coming online in the next few years. They're already working on that. That interferometer is being installed right now, and in the future, there'll be uh, LIGO India, so the overall network will be five detectors worldwide. Okay, and uh, in addition to um, you know being able to pinpoint um, the, the location of uh, the, the source of gravitational waves in the sky, is there are, are there any um, 
you know, types of gravitational waves, let's say, that, that you could detect if you used all of your detectors together that, let's say, you couldn't detect. Um, you know, I'm thinking of uh, you know, a, a radio telescope where you've got a number of different uh, locations to make one big uh, telescope. Is that possible with, with gravitational there, wave detectors? There is, there is one physical phenomena that, 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 um, that, that Mike didn't mention, which is that gravitational waves um, come in polarizations. So, so they're, they're, they're two orthogonal polarizations. And, and, and so we expect for some of our sources that, that, um, that knowing both polarizations might help understand the source location in the sky and other aspects of its physics. So that's one thing you get with multiple ob observatories. When we built the two LIGOs, um, they, were, they were deliberately chosen to be maximally sensitive to the same polarization. Um, they're not exactly because the Earth curves, but um, the full global network will, will, will be picking up both polarizations really well. That'll help us find on where on the sky the sources are and it'll also help us un help us see essentially more sources because we're sensitive to both polarizations. Okay, great. Um, wh uh, another question that, um, that that comes to mind, um, you know, at the, at the moment, um, the announcement of, of gravitational waves events, um, you know, it, it, it's a big deal. It's um, you know reported in a in a big journal and. Um, uh, you know, it's an event, let's say. What, do, do, do any of you have any feeling for when, um, you know, this will be a regular occurrence? You know, you'll come in to the office and there'll be five events on your desk. Um, uh, is, is that something that we can see in, in 10 years or is it going to be 20 years? What, when do you think that'll happen? I think uh, it will happen sooner than we think. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, again, it takes years to tune, <coughs> fine tune the detectors so that we can exploit them at the potential that they have. So when, um, when the LIGO detectors and the Virgo detector uh, reach that sensitivity, which we expect it will be in a few years, we might have an event demand, perhaps more than an event demand, and that would be great. But just like the advanced LIGO technology and the advanced LIGO and Virgo detectors are the result of work on technology in the past decade, there are a lot of ideas and, and work on technology for developing the next generation of detectors. So just like uh, optical astronomy that started with Galileo having that first telescope and then evolving every year, every decade, we have better telescopes and better technologies to look farther in the universe, that will happen with this field too. So it's not, with LIGO and Virgo detectors, especially when CAGRA and LIGO India join, we will have very likely an event a month, perhaps an event a week, depending on the sensitivity of the network. But that's just the beginning. <laughs> this is a good new era. It was said. It was said before, but I, I, I think I think it's important to note that the, that the, the things we've observed so far, um, black holes in that mass range, we had no idea how many there would be. So we didn't even really have. We, we didn't. We didn't have a data based estimate. Of how many there would be, um, the neutron stars. That's why if you'd if you'd interviewed any of us several years ago, we would have been going on and on about neutron stars because that's the thing we'd analyzed and written about. Um, and so, of course, you know, we all have to hope that there are other things that that we haven't been talking about much that 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 also show up in the data soon. We'll see. And so, so when do you think that um, you know we 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 could have a let's say a gravitational wave map of the sky? in the same way that, you know, we've got maps of the sky and optical frequencies and radio frequencies. What, what, when do you think we could, we could see the first meaningful gravitational wave map of the sky? <laughs> you want to? <laughs> Thank you for, um, whenever one makes prediction, it's easy to be proven wrong. <laughs> but um, it, it will depend, of course, on on the sensitivity of the detectors, so, so how the sensitivity improvement goes in the next years and how this uh, network expands, because as it was <clears throat> explained before, the uh, accuracy in the localization information is so much dependent on how many detectors we have that can be observing at the same time. 
that's what we have a, a handle on. Then, of course, there is nature. And as Joe was saying before, the only really reliable estimates that we have are the ones concerning the in-spiral of binary neutron star systems. But we know there's a whole host of probable other systems there. So it's, it's hard uh, to try and convolve these two factors together and answer your question. If I were to guess, I would say that probably uh, in the next uh, five years, I hope we'll be able to produce the first uh, uh, reasonable map of the gravitational wave sky. Oh, that's great. L looking forward to seeing that. So thank you. Um, one final question. Um, what, uh, and I'd like to, um, you know, maybe ask everyone to, to, to answer this question briefly. What, what are you looking forward to most over the next year or so um, working on LIGO? So, um, Alessandra, what, uh, what are you looking, on, looking forward to? Uh, well, I really look forward to the first section of a continuous gravitational wave. So these are waves which are emitted uh, not because of the motion of uh, a binary system together, but because perhaps uh, a very compact, astonishingly compact object, so there's a slight deformation, a small mountain. And so these are signals that are very different from the ones that we have detected. They're nearly everlasting, and they're very, very weak trains of gravitational waves. And I personally look very much forward to that detection. Gabby, what are you looking forward to? Oh, I look forward to having this reliable network of five detectors working all the time, producing this map in parallel with us building the next generation. Mike? Uh, well, you asked about the next year time frame, so I, I'm looking forward to seeing what the results of our next observation run, the run that we're in right now, the second observation run, really, really keen to see, uh, you know, more binary black holes and perhaps something else in the data, and then launching again into a, a commissioning era where we begin working on the noise again to go to our next observation run. That'll all happen in the next year. Brian? Well, more binary black holes, of course, but I'd, I'd really love to see something with an optical counterpart in the next year. That would be, uh, well, in the, in the O2 run, that would be very, very exciting and make O2 live up to O1. <laughs> <laughs> tough act to follow. Yeah, tough act to follow. <laughs> and o over to Glasgow, uh, Sheila, what are you most looking forward to over the next few years working on LIGO? So I think clearly more, more detections, more sources, coming in, that's going to be very exciting. But as I mentioned before, we multitask. So we're planning for the future already. So working hard in the lab, thinking about the future, having that vision for what's coming after advanced LIGO, making it even better, what's coming next. So we can see gravitational waves from sources out to the edge of the universe. Plan ahead. And Joe? What about you? What do you? Oh, all right. So they've taken all the good ones. So, so here's what I have. Here's what the, here's what we have left. Uh, there are two things. One is I, I want I want um, Map to discover those pulsars so that we can use them to do calibration and turn off all the calibration systems, which are irritating. And the other thing is um, I, I I want I want the various space agencies to launch um, a space antenna that sees that sees the first few the the, the first outer orbits of these black hole, large black hole coalescences and give us a time to mark on our calendar uh, when it'll show up in LIGO. That'll be kind of cool. So we can both schedule our events and not have to calibrate. That's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> well, that's great. Th thank you very much to, um, to everyone who's joined us. Um, that was um, Joe Giami, who's at um, LIGO uh, in Livingston, Louisiana. Um, also with us is uh, Sheila Rowan, who's the director of the Institute of Gravitational Research at the University of Glasgow. And in, in Washington, D.C., we had um, Mike Landry, who uh, works at Livingston Hanford in Washington State, Brian O'Reilly, who is at LIGO Livingston, um, Alessandra Papa, who is at the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics, and Gabriela Gonzala, who is at the, uh, sorry, Gabriela Gonzalez, who is at the, uh, who's at Louisiana State University and is the spokesperson 
for uh, the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. I'm Hamish Johnston, the editor of physicsworld.com. Thank you very much for joining us. I think it's been a, a fantastic conversation um, about a fascinating topic. Um, there's lots more about the Physics World Breakthrough of the Year on uh, physicsworld.com. And you can also read about our nine runners up. Um, uh, we have nine other uh, highly commended uh, bits of physics research done in 2016. And you can read all about that on our website. So thank you very much to our guests and thanks to, to you for watching. Bye. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.